and give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I am the promise that you promised me. You know, and this is the gospel. This is an unconditional promise. They preach the gospel to people. They start a church, and then that church starts preaching the gospel. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. All right. Of course, we are in Genesis chapter number 32 this evening. Last week, uh, we concluded Genesis 31, which was about Jacob fleeing from Laban. He, uh, at the end, we saw how he was freed from the bondage of uh, his wicked father-in-law, Laban. They made a vow to one another, vowing that they would not cross over this particular uh, uh, a monument or landmark and that they would do no harm to one another. And then here in chapter number 32, we're going to continue seeing him while he is in the midst of his travels uh, back to the land of Canaan. And actually where he's going to be greeting Esau. This is actually where uh, he is uh, preparing to greet Esau. We're going to begin there in Genesis chapter 32. Look at verse number 1. It says this, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, <coughs> he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Maenaim. Now, it's interesting that he immediately is able to uh, recognize that this is God's host. Because there are multiple times in the Bible when an angel will appear unto man and no one is able to tell whether or not it is an angel. They can't even distinguish it from uh, whether it's a, just a regular normal man like the, the two angels that went into Sodom and Gomorrah. They thought they were just men. Bring those men out that we may know them, right? So they thought that they were just men. So obviously these angels, either their glory was being revealed or they are a different sect of angels where it is very obvious that they do not look like men. Because when he sees them immediately, he knows this is God's host. So there is something very obvious that this is uh, the host of God or the angels of God. Now, what is the purpose of angels and why are the angels <coughs> appearing unto Jacob right now? Number one, I believe that the angels are coming because they are reassuring Jacob. Of course, he is being obedient and going back. God appeared on him and told him to go back, and now he is in the way. He had an obstacle, and what can happen when you have obstacles? You can become discouraged. So he had the obstacle with Laban, and I believe that God is sending the angels just to encourage him. Uh, what the purpose of angels actually told us in Hebrews chapter number 2, I believe, where it says that they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those that should be heirs of salvation. So the purpose of a, a, an angel is to be a ministering spirit. So that would make sense if they're coming, coming right now. We know that they're coming to minister. That's their job. That they would be uh, giving him reassurance while he is being obedient to God. Like, hey, you are doing the right thing. Keep doing this. I'm sure that that was a great encouragement unto him. I'm sure they were able to minister unto him. Not only that, to show that God's hand of protection is upon him because he's getting ready to go back to Esau. And as I'm sure you saw there when we were reading, he's afraid. He's afraid that he's going back to Esau. So this can also be an encouragement, not only because of his, his, his setback that he already experienced, but also because he is fearful already at this point because he's going to, uh, to see Esau very shortly. It says in verse number 3, <clears throat> And Jacob sent messengers before him, to Esau his brother unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So you could even interpret that as being a result of maybe the encouragement that he was given from the angels, the ministering spirits. You see the land of Seir there. Oftentimes uh, when it talks about Seir, it's talking about the land of Edom or the land of Esau. And most of the time it talks about Mount Seir, the majority of the times that it comes up in the Bible. So uh, that's what that's referring to. Look at verse number 4. <clears throat> And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, <coughs> I have sojourned with Laban <coughs> and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. What we can see in these couple of verses is, is great humility that Jacob has towards Esau right now, and I'm sure it is because he is fearful. We're going to be reading in just a moment, and he is extremely fearful of Esau. We saw when we were given the description of Esau and Jacob. Esau was uh, said to be a, a, a wild man, right? He was talking about how he's out in the wilderness, right? And Jacob was what? It says that he was a plain man. Now, I don't think that Jacob was like a, a wimp, especially compared to like millennials today. He's sleeping outside and using the rocks. Here in just a moment, we're going to see him wrestling a man from beginning, from night 
time until the, bra uh, the day breaks, right? So he is not a wimp. But his, his brother is a hunter by trade. His brother, by comparison, is a much rougher person than he is. So that would make sense. That he, and also because of the rage that I'm sure he's, he's expecting maybe for his brother to have. So we can see that, that that is probably a motive to why he is so humble towards Esau right now is because of his fear that he has. And it's genuine also because he says in verse 4, And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. So he's saying this unto them. Not even This isn't even necessarily a part of the message. Then he goes on, and in the message, you know, it says there at the end of verse 5, And I have sent to tell my lord, and then he says, That I may find grace. In thy sight. Verse 6, And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. It is burning up in here. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all the black Hebrew Israelites are like, That's nothing yet, Esau. <laughs> right? I'm going to let Brother Elliot make the next video <laughs> to, the, to the black Hebrew Israelites. That's why I'm wearing red tonight. You know, because of, of uh, Edom, right? And we're reading about Esau. It's perfect. Look there at uh, verse number 6. <clears throat> Stay back on track here. Verse number 6, it says, And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. So I always, I always saw this, this very strange. This verse particularly is very, it's just very strange to me because uh, the messengers don't give any further answer, uh, implying to me, the implication to me is that Esau did not specify when he said that he was coming, right? When he told you know, the messengers, hey, I'm coming, he didn't specify to them or the messengers did not, uh, they did not uh, try to clarify like, hey, is he coming with good or is he coming with bad, right? Is it good news or bad news? Is he, what cause is he coming for? So it's kind of a strange situation or maybe, and I thought about this, we know that when he comes, uh, spoiler alert, that he's happy to see his brother, right? So maybe it's just that he is excited to see him. Maybe that's why he just very spontaneously just went and got everything ready and he didn't tell you know, any sort of message to be brought back. I mean, if, if a messenger came unto you and you hadn't seen your brother in many years, 20 years exactly, right? You hadn't seen your brother in 20 years, would you just leave the messenger and just go get the 400 men and not even tell the messenger to bring a message back like to your brother like, hey, tell him I miss him and I'm coming to see him. No, you would most likely say, hey, tell him that I'm coming immediately, right? So I always thought it was strange that the messengers don't specify here. And the way that Jacob reacts is though that they don't specify because it doesn't record them specifying, number one, of why he's coming and what type of intent that he has. So uh, look at verse number uh, seven. It says this, Then Jacob was greatly afraid <coughs> and distressed. So you see how he's uh, interpreting what's happening. He's bringing 400 men with him. Now what does it sound like to you if we hadn't been privy to the rest of the story that's about to happen right now? You would think he's coming to destroy Jacob and everything with him, right? To kill all of them. He's bringing 400 men with him. And the way even that the messengers word it makes you think like he's coming for harm, right? He's not coming with peace. So that's the way that Jacob takes it as well. <clears throat> I keep reading there. And he divided the people <coughs> that was with, with him and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So he's splitting them up into two groups, it says, or two bands as it's worded here. Verse uh, 8, <clears throat> and said, if Esau, no, I'm sorry, verse 9, and Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which sayest unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. Verse 10, I love this verse. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I, have pa I, I passed over this Jordan and now am become two bands. So I love that verse. That was actually one of the very first verses when I started reading my Bible. <clears throat> Nobody had really pushed me to memorization. I'd done memorization a lot as a kid, just, uh, you know, just Exodus 20, things like that, because I grew up in a Christian school, and we had to memorize, like, the Beatitudes, I remember that, and just random things, but I never did it, like, on my own personal, you know, out of my own personal, you know, uh, uh, volition, where I desired to do it, out of my own will, right? 
I remember when I was reading through the Bible for the very first time, the very first time and I got to Genesis 32, I liked this verse so much. And I would have been 21 at this time that I was like, man, I'm going to memorize that verse. And I only got halfway in. But it was the part that I liked a lot. It ended, when I memorized it, is the part where, it, where he says, uh, where it ends with, which thou hast showed unto thy servant. And the reason why I could relate to that <clears throat> is because I got saved at a very young age. And then I went wayward. You know, I lived a very sinful life and, and you know, did a lot of things at that time that I was very ashamed of. And when I came back to God, this verse you know, resonated with me. Because it was so true to me, because I am not worthy, of, you know, thy servant, he says, is not worthy of all the mercy and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. So it's a powerful verse. And even if you can't relate to my specific testimony, it's still, still just as true to you today. And if you want to be able to do something great with God, this is the commonality between every person that is a great man of God in the Bible. If you want to do something mightily for God, you need to have this type of humility that, that, that we see with Jacob here. Look at David and read the Psalms. You know what just, you know one thing that just is emphasized in all of the Psalms is just you can see his humility to God when he's praying to God. He is so humble before God. If you want to do something great for God, all of the men that do something great for God in the Bible have one thing in common. All the time. It's they are, they are extremely humble. And God wants to receive the glory, right? So he wants to use someone that can just be a vessel for him. And then he can just basically reflect everything off of them. And then he ultimately receives the glory. We're just an instrument. It's not about us. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with, with your name, you know, my name, nothing. None of that has any... What we need to do is seek to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that we do should be to seek to glorify Jesus in every, every area of our life. And we shouldn't be consumed or, or, or we shouldn't even... We shouldn't at all be concerned, really is a better way to put it. We shouldn't be concerned at all with uh, whether or not, you know, what, whether or not people like us or whether or not, you know, uh, uh, people, you know, like the things you say or, or, or anything like that. Whether people, uh, you know, look at you and glorify you, you shouldn't be concerned with that at all. We should have the attitude of Jacob, a strong attitude of humility. And always understand that wherever you are, if you look at where Jacob is now, he has so many, so much possessions. He has obviously the wives and the maidservants, but he has so much even outside of that. He has all of the, the great possessions of the, the sheep and the goats and the oxen, right? All of that. The herds. He has so many things. And we saw just the, just a, a, we were able to uh, peer into it just slightly with just the gift that he gives. And it's massive. So God has blessed him mightily. And he says there at the end, For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and, and now I am become two bands. So not only should we be humble in our lives right now, right? But we need to, even if God blesses us mightily, maybe in a, uh, a physical way, maybe with worldly possessions, right? Maybe God will bless people in that way. God will bless you with carnal things sometimes. Even if you, you get great gain in carnal possessions and God gives you those things and blesses you with those things, you still should have that same exact attitude even after Jacob had all these great things. You should look at everything that you have and say, I am not worthy of all the mercy and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. No matter how much you have, you're not worth of it. You're not worthy of it. Doesn't matter what you have, we are not worthy of it. We don't deserve anything. We deserve, you know what you deserve? You deserve to go to hell. That's the honest truth. You deserve a punishment. You don't deserve good, right? So we need to be thankful for what God has given us in all areas of our life, even when our possessions grow and accumulate and increase, right? Look there at verse number 11. <coughs> Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. It's so ironic that we're reading about this right now. Verse 12. And thou sayest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude. And he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau his brother. Two hundred she-goats and twenty he-goats, two hundred ewes and twenty rams, uh, thirty milk uh, camels, I know uh, Scorby says milch, thirty milk camels with, with their colts, forty kine, and ten bulls, twenty she-asses and ten foals. And he delivered them 
into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me and put a space betwixt drove and drove. Now I believe that there are two purposes uh, for this separation. So each of them, if you look at the 200 she-goats, that's going to be one drove. So there'll be a, a servant that is over the 200 she-goats. Then there are the 20 he-goats. That is also a distinct or a separate <coughs> uh, drove or group, if you will. Right? And there'll be a servant over them. So he has a separation between each one of these droves when they're going out. Right? I believe, number one... Uh, one of the reasons is because he's using this as a buffer. He is afraid. The same reason why he split up the bands, right? That he's using each one of these as a buffer. He puts them all together. It would be easier for him to destroy all of them all at the same time. He puts a separation between them. The same uh, st uh, strategies are used in the army, right? So they put this buffer in between them. They come and they eliminate this one. Then they have a time to travel till they get to the second uh, 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 layer, if you will, right? So I believe that is a, it's the same reason why, like I said, he separated them into the two bands. But not only that, it actually tells you the other reason why he does this. Look at verse 16. Uh, verse uh, 17. And he commanded the foremost. Four means like front, like a foreman. Foremost saying, When Esau my brother meeteth thee, and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou? And whither goest thou? And whose are these before thee? <coughs> then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. So he commanded the guy that's in the very front. That's what he wanted him to, to tell him. When he asked him, hey, what are these? Who are they for? He asked all these questions. Say, hey, this is a present that's coming from Jacob. And he's coming behind me, right? Then look at verse 18. Then thou shalt say, oh, I'm sorry, verse 19. And so commanded he the second and the third and all that followed the droves. So all of the droves, each group with each of these uh, uh, livestock, that's what he wants them to, uh, wants each of the servants to say to Esau when he comes. And then, uh, so, so that statement alone, sorry pal, people make that statement when they see an angel and they know it's an angel and it's not God. And it's clearly the angel of the Lord and it's not the Lord according to the Holy Spirit. So I think this is clear. I don't think there's anywhere out of it. If you believe the Bible, if you don't, if, you're, if you believe something else, you're not comparing Scripture to Scripture. Let me just say that. Because me comparing Scripture to Scripture, we see two passages that are almost identical. The same statement is made by a messenger. We see this person being called a man. And yes, there are other instances where the Lord is called a man. Three men, but most of the time in the book of Genesis when a man appears and it's someone from heaven, what is it? It's an angel. Most of the time. Right here we see the same statement made by the angel of the Lord in Judges 13. Exact same statement. A very distinct, specific statement. And then we see that angel saying, I'm not the Lord. You know what that means? That's two incidents in the Old Testament. Two incidences in the Old Testament where it, where, and I'm not saying that there aren't other occurrences where the Lord manifests Himself. I'm not saying that at all. But it, you know what people do oftentimes is they, when they believe something, especially if the Bible doesn't teach what they believe, they'll search so hard to try to find things like that. Let me just tell you this. I'll submit to you that I feel very confident that, Gen that Genesis 32 is the, is the same person as Judges 13. And that, let me tell you this too. That is, that is, this is, this is a fact. That is the safest interpretation. That is the safest interpretation when comparing Scripture to Scripture. It's by far the safest. Now, let me say this also. Let me get, put a disclaimer in there. Could this possibly be? I mean, is there a chance? Well, it doesn't give you specific. It could, but I don't believe that it is. It doesn't tell you either way, but it's too similar with Judges 13. I believe the Bible's trying to tell you by comparing Scripture with Scripture who this is here. I think it's clear that, that the Bible's trying to tell you who appeared here by, by the same statement of what both of them saw and by the angel making the exact same statement when his name is asked for. You say, well, that has to be because he says... Why are you at, wherefore is it that thou just asked after my name? You know, because it's the name of Jesus. Now, I can prove to you in Judges 13 that that angel says the same thing, and it clearly is not the Lord. Without a doubt, is not. he says that he's not God. Don't offer an offering to me, because he knew that he thought that he was the Lord. He said, don't offer an offering to me, offer it to God. You want to, I'm not going to eat bread with you. You want to offer an offering, I'll stay, but you've got to offer it to God. For Manoah thought that, knew not that he was the angel of the Lord, saying... He, he thought that he was the Lord, didn't know or understand that he was the angel of the Lord. 
Comparing Scripture with Scripture, by far the safest interpretation, and I don't believe that it is even, I, I believe that it is, it is strong, strong that it is not, this particular incident here in Genesis 32, is not an Old Testament appearance of Christ. Now, are there other Old, Old Testament appearances of Christ? I, yeah, of course. You would have to say that Genesis 18 is an Old Testament appearance of Christ. The Lord came and stood there. Who else could it be? He is the image of the invisible God. If anyone sees God, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Amen. You know what body he had? He had the body that he assumed thousands of years later. He wasn't made legitimately flesh yet. He didn't go through the process of being born and actually taking on flesh in his nature. You know what he did? He temporarily... You know, is anything too hard for the Lord? He temporarily just stepped out of eternity to interact with mankind and to show the image of the Lord there to Abraham. Wouldn't it make sense? What is Abraham? He's called the friend of God. Wouldn't it make sense if the glory of God is found in Jesus? Wouldn't it make sense that he would reveal such a thing to someone who's his friend? To Abraham? When the, whole, when the seed that's being promised to him, all of that, the whole promise of him being you know, the father of many nations actually comes through and is fulfilled in Christ, wouldn't it make sense that if he's going to do that for anybody, that he would do it for Abraham? Right? I think that makes perfect sense to me. But hey, back to Genesis chapter 32, I think this is very clear that this is not Jesus. I think that this is clearly the angel of the Lord. I think it's the, first, I think it's the same person as, as, as Judges 13 that appears to Manoah. That can be proven to not be the Lord. Um, and I believe that you can compare Scripture to Scripture and build a very strong case uh, you know, um, that this is the same person, thereby concluding that this is not also the Lord, but rather the angel of the Lord. <clears throat> and the statement doesn't, doesn't uh, prove that. Seeing God face to face is made, even when Manoah clarifies that he is not the Lord. So that doesn't prove that either. Look at verse 31. And as he passed over Penuel, so that's the same thing as Peniel, it's just the Bible will do that, just like Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadrezzar. Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Halting is like, uh, it's like limping. You know, how the Bible will talk about, uh, you know, it'll talk about how when Jesus will go and heal people, the halt and the lame. You know, uh, like in John 8, I believe it is, uh, when he goes to the pool. You know, it talks about the halt and the lame would go there. It's just talking about people that, like, maybe have a bad leg or something and they're just, like, barely getting around. And, and then the lame or the maimed is, like, a per someone that's maimed, like, has no legs, basically, is a, is a person that's the maimed, it, that is maimed. Look at verse 32. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which, strength, which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. That's a, a weird verse and I don't know how to explain it. So let's uh, go ahead and bow and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for this night. Just the verse there it says, saying, On this manner shall you speak unto Esau when ye find him. I'll tell you another reason why I believe that he's saying this is that uh, when you receive a present, right? If you, were to, if you were to allow your children to open up all of their presents all at one time, do you think they'd be happy? They would, right? They would like to open them all up at one time. But do you think that they would... They may not understand this, but do you think that they would... Uh, 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 do you think it would hit, ho hit home more or that they would enjoy it in a sincere way more than if you gave them one? Like, hey, I got a present for you. And they open that up. They're like, yeah, this is awesome. And they're like, hey, I got another present for you. They're like, yeah. And then you give them another one. They're like, awesome. They would enjoy that much more because it just keeps coming, right? That's what I believe that Jacob's doing right. He's trying to find grace in Esau's sight. So I believe it would make sense strategically, like we saw in his mind before, he's breaking them up into the two bands. That is, that is, he puts Rachel in one and then Leah in the other and Leah's children, Rachel, he separates them up that way. But then also, and that's just in case Esau comes and smites one, the other can get away. That would make sense that he's doing that in a sense in, uh, with the droves. It's kind of a buffer, right? He gets, it, you know, and, and they have to travel before they get to the next one. That would make sense that it's, it's strategic as far as just in case warfare breaks out. But it also makes sense that he's just continually receiving this grace, right? He's giving him one and he's like, oh, thank you. And then he goes to the next one and he's like, oh man, 20 he goats now, right? He gets the 20 egos, and then he goes to the next one. 
30 milk camels. And he gets the next one. And it says, with their colts, 40 kind. And then he keeps getting them, right? I think in your mind mentally, whether you realize it or not, it's better to receive gifts like that. And I think that's why he's doing that. You know, I think Jacob is trying to also be... You know, you have to think the type of uh, uh, man that Jacob is, is what? Think about it. What was his name? Right. Supplanter. So... He could utilize those same type of skills that he has, social skills that he has, to be able to, in a sense, manipulate Esau into giving him grace in this sense. Because he's trying very hard to get grace in Esau's sight. So he's like, what, is, what can I do that will, that will cause me you know, to receive grace in his eyes? Right? So that makes sense to me. That's why I believe he does that. Look at verse number 18. Or I'm sorry, we read that. Verse 20. And say ye moreover, <coughs> Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me. And afterward, I will see his face. So notice the purpose of the gift. Of course, he's trying to appease him. Or another way to say it is like uh, uh, to pacify, right? To appease him um, with the present that goeth before me. I lost my place. Uh, and afterward, I will see his face per adventure that's like perhaps... He will accept of me. Verse 21. So went the present over before him and himself lodged that night in the company. And he rose up that night and took his two wives <coughs> and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. <sighs> Having some stomach trouble. I got a kombucha here. So, uh, is everyone familiar with what the word Ford means? This is why the, you have the truck called Ford. Is everyone familiar with the word Ford? It just means like a shallow part and like a, a, a creek, if you will. or It can even be in a river. But actually, right here, it is, it is uh, defined for us. Because if you look at the next verse, it says this. And he took them and sent them over the, you see what it says? Brook and sent over that he had. So a ford is like a creek or a brook. We will oftentimes also refer to uh, fords as, it can be even, like I said, like a, maybe a larger body of water, like a river, where it's very shallow. And that's why the truck is called a ford, saying it can even drive over you know, a creek or it can drive over you know, a brook. Is why, that's why they're called fords. But if you uh, look back, I want to highlight something in verse 22. I got two pretty interesting things at the end of this chapter I want to uh, uh, emphasize. Verse number 22, it says this, and he rose up that night and took his two wives, and then it says this, and his two, what? Women servants, right? Now, who are the two women servants? Does everybody remember their names? Bilhah and Zilpah, right? Now, those women, were they just servants, or did they have also another status? What were they? Well, they were wives. They were called wives, and that's actually the point that I'm about to make. So, a, a concubine... <clears throat> You know, some people don't believe this, but a concubine is a wife. You can prove this from Judges, and you can also prove this from uh, Keturah. She is a conc I'm sorry, uh, that was his second wife, actually. Uh, Hagar. Hagar is referred to as a concubine, but she is also referred to as a wife. Now, I believe, after studying this out a little bit more, you know, I knew that a concubine was a wife, but I also knew that there was a difference between a wife and a concubine as well. So there is a wife which is just your normal wife that you marry, right? But the, also throughout the Bible, people will have concubines which are also wives, but they have a different status. There's obviously a distinction between them and normally the first wife or normally the, the better treated wife, right? Uh, an example of this is the fact that Solomon had uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. So there's a distinction that's made there. But we also see that the Bible uses them interchangeable. So what is the difference? Well, isn't it interesting that the two wives here are called what? Women servants. You notice that? Well, I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 16. Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 16. It would make sense that the, that the difference actually lies. that the, the, You have the normal wife, the regular wife, but then you also have the concubine, which is a wife, but she is also, she is also a woman servant. Go to, uh, as I said, Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 16. It says this. <coughs> And he entreated Abraham, this is Pharaoh, and he, and he entreated Abraham well for her sake. And this is talking about his wife Sarai. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants. And it says, and maid servants and she asses and camels. Now if you think about it, uh, Hagar is from where? What is her lineage? She's from Egypt. 
The Bible tells you that Hagar is an Egyptian, right? When this takes place, where is he? He is in Egypt. You know, some of the things that he has given is, is men servants, it says, and he's also given maid servants or women servants, if you will. Now, I believe, as I, as I said, it would make sense that that's when he acquired, uh, um, I'm sorry, Hagar as his maid servant or his woman servant, and then later on she became his concubine, which would be a wife that is still a servant. Not only that, if you go back there to Genesis chapter number... 29, I believe it is. I could be wrong about that. Um, <clears throat> no, it is chapter number 20. It is chapter number 29. If you look at chapter number 29, verse number 29, it says, And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhah, his handmaid, to be her maid. So notice, what was Bilhah before this? She was a handmaid. What was Hagar before she became a wife? She was basically a handmaid or a maid servant is what he would have acquired from uh, uh, if that's where she came from, which would make perfect sense. Now, furthermore, if you look over at Genesis 20, go to Genesis chapter number 20. This, this is also interesting because you see the exact same language there at the end of chapter 20 is where the similar uh, situation takes place with Abimelech and Abraham. <clears throat> it says at the very end, the very last verse actually, it says, For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife, and then it says, and his maid servants, and they bear children. So notice who he's having children with. Wife, and then who else? Maid servants. And what is Hagar called? A maid servant. What are the women called? Zilpah and Bilhah. Maid servants. Notice that they do not have the same status, and they are actually not referred to as wives even in Genesis 32. Think about that. It says his two wives and his two women servants. So it doesn't say his four wives, but are they his wives? They are his wives. But it says two wives and two women servants. Wouldn't it make sense that that is two wives and two concubines? Wouldn't it make sense that Hagar is referred to as a woman servant? Abimelech is having children with who? with his wife and his maidservants. They're most likely concubines, which would make sense that concubine, I believe, after studying this out a little bit more, is a woman servant that is a wife. I think that makes the most sense. Look there at uh, verse number uh, 23 now, back in <coughs> chapter 32. Verse number 23 once more. We read it before, we'll read it again. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. We still see Jacob here assuming the role as the leader like we saw him doing in the, ch in the past chapter. He didn't do that too much while he was there with Laban. Laban was more of the boss. Now we see him you know, uh, being more assertive and taking the role and, and leading his family. Look at verse number uh, 24. That's where I want to get into the last topic really of the night. We might end a little bit uh, uh, early tonight. Look at verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. So he stayed there on the other side of the brook, right? So make sure you get the picture of what's going on. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, <coughs> he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So this is a serious wrestling match, right? There's a man wrestling with him. And, and to the point of where his, his thigh comes out of joint. I believe that it's talking about his hip. That makes the most sense. And uh, it says in verse 26, And he said, Let me go, <coughs> for the day breaketh. Now, <coughs> that's the angel saying that. The angel is saying that to Jacob, like, hey, let me go, because the, the sun is getting ready to come up. It says, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. So Jacob is obviously not, you know, a complete sissy. He's wrestling. I mean, that takes a lot of endurance and a lot of strength to wrestle, let alone with an angelic being. I don't know what their strength is in comparison to men. But, I mean, he's wrestling with, with you know, a celestial being all night until the day breaks. And to the point where the, and he's got his thigh, his, his, his hip is, is, is completely out of joint and he continues wrestling to the point where the angel's like, get off of me. It's like, let me go, right? And he says, I will not let thee go <coughs> except thou bless me. And then verse 27, it's cool because it's like almost like the angel concedes, right? He says, and, and he said unto him, what is thy name? Or I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Verse 27. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. So he asked them, it's a rhetorical question. Of course, this, this man or this angel knows his name. And he asked that for this reason, verse 27, 28. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, 
For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Now that's talking about, I believe, that wrestling match there uh, uh, with, with, with a, an application, but also I believe there is a spiritual application to this with the way in which uh, uh, Jacob has been, uh, you know, like I said, assuming the role of leader. He's, he's following God. He's being obedient to God's commands, going back to the land of Canaan. And of course, he is the promised seed and received that, that uh, uh, promise or that blessing. So it says that he prevailed. There you get the, the actually the <coughs> meaning or the definition of the word Israel, which means prince. That's what the word Israel means. So he changes his name from Jacob to Israel, and his name now means prince because he is going to be the prince of the nations, the king of the nations, right? Um, not only that, you know, what we see here as a blessing, his name being changed, this happens very often throughout the Bible. You see people's names being changed. Abram to Abraham, right? You see uh, Saul to Paul. So this is very common. It's actually a blessing. It can be a blessing from God when it comes directly from God. Look at verse number uh, 29. It says, And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him. Verse 30, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Now, I'm going to spend a few minutes on this, and I'll go ahead and tell you that I confidently believed that this was an Old Testament appearance of Christ. Uh, but I'll say this, that I, I am confident, very confident now, that it is not. And I'm going to show you a verse that I believe is that is extremely powerful that n not only defeats this particular incident of it being an Old Testament appearance of Christ, but also another one that is in tandem with this. If you look there at verse number 29, that statement, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? That is found where else? Does anyone know? It's in the book of Judges, right? I believe it's Judges 13. Judges 13. Judges chapter number 13 with Manoah. So almost this exact same statement, a very similar situation. And I believe that it is extremely clear and almost everyone believes that it is the same person, that they would say that it's the same person. Now, before I get into what I'm about to explain, let me clarify a few things. Just because I don't believe that this particular uh, uh, occurrence here is an Old Testament appearance of Christ, nor do I believe now that Judges 13 is an Old Testament appearance of Christ, people will maybe try to attack us and say, hey, well, you just don't believe that Christ is eternal or that, you know, the Son of God is eternal. We believe that Jesus is God. Amen? Amen? And that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I believe that Jesus is from everlasting. He is the Alpha, and He is the Omega. He is the one and only true God, and has forever existed, and will always exist, has never had a point in time where He did not exist. He is not created. He is before everything. So let me clarify that before someone tries to slur or, 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 or you know, sling stupid remarks at us and try to say something stupid. So the reason why people want to hold on to this, this passage and also Judges 13 is because people try to use these two passages to prop up the teaching of eternal sonship. And because this person is called a man here, they'll say, see, this proves that Christ was a man before that. He's always a man, right? And let me tell you this, the majority of Baptists do not believe that, that he was always a man or always in the flesh. Just the other day, I was listening to some guy named uh, 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 Frank Turek. Does anybody know who that is? Like cross-examination? I saved the clip and everything just in case I needed it for future reference, and he plainly says that Jesus was not always in the flesh. He was not always a man. Like, like he actually says... I'm almost positive that he said, I know that he says he was not always in the flesh, and I'm almost positive he always also says he was not always a man. But I think those two things are, you can see man and flesh being used interchangeable, especially in the book of Psalms. We're talking about being saved by, man can't save me, nor can flesh. It's using them interchangeable, right? Is that my phone? Can you shut that thing off? Thank you. So it'll use them interchangeable, right? <clears throat> it'll use the two interchangeable. And uh, you just answer it and put it on speaker real quick. I'll talk to them. Yeah. They'll use the two man and flesh interchangeable. And they'll try to use this because they believe that it, 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 it supports their doctrine to try to say that Christ, you know, is eternally in the flesh. He's eternally a man. That is, I didn't have this in my sermon, but let's go to just a couple of passages real quick because tonight's sermon is going to be over probably short anyways. So let's just go to a couple of passages just to prove that wrong, just to put that to rest. I realize that some people... 
You know, it's, they're, they're never going to get right with the scriptures. They just, they just have a pet doctrine that they love. And even though the verses are super clear, they will just continually reject them. But we're going to look at super clear verses that prove that Jesus was not always in the flesh. <clears throat> look at John chapter number 1, verse number 14. It says this, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. How much... Can it get any easier or more simple to understand than that? Anyone? Can it? Isn't that extremely easy? The Word was made flesh. Do you understand? Made? That means that it... it what, what does it mean when the Bible says that God made the heavens and the earth or made the heaven and the earth? What, what's going on there? They were not there previously and now there, there was a change that took place, right? For example, if you look in uh, verse number 12, it says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. It's the same concept. It's saying they weren't the sons of God, but then they became the, son of, the sons of God, right? Well, it's the same thing with Jesus. It's actually a perfect example. He was not the Son of God, and then He became the Son of God. He existed previous to that, but not as the Son of God. Just like I exist previous to that, but then I become the Son of God, right? Well, guess what? The same thing is with Jesus. He was God, and He has always existed, but then He became the Son of God. Just because there's a point in which he becomes the Son of God, that doesn't mean that that's the beginning of his origin. It's the beginning of his origin on this earth, in, in, in a body as a man. But he is the God of the Old Testament. He's always existed. Go to Hebrews chapter number 2 as well. I noticed this the other day in my Bible study. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2. Look at how clear this is that Jesus was not always a man. And he was not always in the flesh. I mean... John chapter number 1, verse number 12, it should be extremely simple. It should be just, it should be enough. I mean, just reading the New Testament, we have the generation of Jesus Christ. That is the man. That's what, that's what that is, right? That is the man. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2. I want you to look at <clears throat> verse number, look at verse 12. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. What is that saying? He took part of it saying, he, before that, he didn't have part in flesh and blood. And then he took part of the same. Keep reading. Watch this. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Saying he had to do that so that he could die, right? Before that, he couldn't die because he didn't have flesh and blood. That's the point. Look at the next verse. Look at verse, um, what did we just read? 14, look at verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Look at verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. What does that mean? He didn't take on the nature of angels saying... Prior to this, he didn't have this nature on and decide to take on the nature of angels. No, no, no. He didn't have this nature on and he decided to take on the nature of man. That's what it's saying. He took on this nature. He didn't have it on him before. You can't take something on. And it, that's a ridiculous concept. You have, to just, you have to just basically abandon all logic. You have to completely abandon all logic for this. If you are made something, if you are made flesh, that means you were not flesh before that. It's the same thing as became or become, right? If you are partaking of something, right? You, you know, in this sense, what's being worded? He hadn't partook of it before. He took on him the nature of angels. Look at verse 17. One more time. The word made. Watch this. Wherefore in all things it behoved him, look at this, to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to to God to make re reconciliation for the sins of the people. You can't have it any clearer than that. He was made. It's explaining that he did all of these things and became a man for our redemption so that he could bring us redemption saying this, this was necessary for him to do. He was not flesh and blood in the Old Testament. The Word was made flesh. There was a time in which God became a man. That's so why in the Old Testament the Bible says God is not a man. Because he wasn't a man. Right? There's one God, and that God was not a man. And he became a man. That one God was not flesh and blood, and he became flesh, or was made flesh. He partook of flesh. Right? He took part 
Oh, and, he, and it, like it says right there, use the word made again. It says, behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. What does that mean? He wasn't a man. He wasn't like his brethren, but he became like his brethren, right? He became like us in what sense? He took on him flesh and blood. It is so simple. It is so easy to understand. It is over and over and over again in the Bible. There are other things that you can look at to prove this. It's a ridiculous concept. It's stupid to say that, that he was always a man. It's, it's idiocy. You know what? It is heresy in the face of clear scriptures like this to just keep defying that. Say he's always flesh. When you show someone a verse that says he was made flesh, it is heresy for you to read a verse like that and say, well, he's always. He's always flesh. When the Bible clearly teaches, and the, all, on top of that, this is not a small doctrine. This is, you know, the eternal sonship of Christ is a major heretical doctrine. Right. Major heretical doctrine. It really is. Whether you feel like that or not, it is a major heretical doctrine. You have to understand the humanity of Christ. Everything points towards the God being made flesh. Everything in the Bible. We're supposed to give glory specifically to Jesus Christ. You know what that is? That's God as a man. That's important to understand that. Amen. To understand that He wants, he wants you, when, you, when someone is saved, He wants them to call upon His name as a man. The name that He was given when He became a man. Isn't this an important doctrine to understand? Amen. That he, there was a time in which He partook of flesh and blood. He became a man. Flesh and man, they're, they're, as you can see here, the nature of Abraham, right? It's very clear, the flesh and blood, it's synonymous with being made flesh, being made a man. That's what it's talking about. So, I wanted to start with that. So, those passages <clears throat> in the book of Genesis that we're, that we're referring to, where we see this one particularly, Genesis chapter number 32, we see this person being referenced as a man, Right? Let me ask you this. Who else in the book of Genesis, what other type of creature is referenced as a man? Angels are also referred to as, as, as men or as a man. So that's just a starting point. Wouldn't that make sense? Because we see it elsewhere. We, this is not something new. <clears throat> I'm not saying that it's not possible that he could have you know, uh, shown up and, like as a, Christ, a Christophany and he could have assumed his future body at that time. He's outside of time. He inhabits eternity. Could he step in temporarily in the same form that he had as a fully grown man? Maybe even his glorified body? Of course that's possible. He could, he could step in with the body that he had right before he died on the cross or even his glorified form afterwards. Even how he looked in Revelation 1. He's God. He could do that. So that's still possible, but let's look at the consistency of what we've read so far in the book of Genesis. What is referred to as a man? We see, specifically, we do see the Lord one time, the three men come to him. That is an example of it. But we see angels, right? We see angels. Okay? So look right here in uh, verse number 29. I want you to get this in your mind quickly. It says this, and he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. I want you to turn to Judges chapter number 13. Judges chapter number 13. <clears throat> Look at verse 18 first. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou after, thus after my name, seeing it is a secret? Now, does this sound like it's the same person? It's almost identical, isn't it? Wouldn't you, if you had to, to put money on it, wouldn't you gamble that this is the same person? Doesn't it seem very similar? Responds in the exact same way. Wherefore and why are used interchangeable there? They're the same word. Wherefore askest thou after my name? He says, seeing it as a secret here. The other one he just says, why are you ask, asking after my name? Why askest thou after my name? It's the same exact statement. It's recorded in the Bible, obviously. The, the safe assumption is that this is the same person. That's the safe assumption, okay? <clears throat> Most people believe that this is also an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people do. And they will compare these two, right? I want you to look at verse number... Uh, let's begin in verse 15. And Manoah said... This is the father of, uh, of uh, Samson. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we, until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, 
Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Now I want you to notice the, the, the specific statement that the angel of the Lord says. Because he understands that Manoah thinks that he is the Lord. Do you know what it said? he says? He says, if you'll detain me, I'm not going to eat any bread with you. But then he says this, and if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. What's his point? He's not the Lord. You can't offer it unto me. And then the Holy Spirit, just in case you didn't understand the implications of that statement, clarifies. It says afterwards, for Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Now, there's something very interesting if you keep reading here. It says this, and this is one of the reasons why people will try to say that this was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, but we just saw that it's not the Lord. That's, that's pretty clear. Keep reading in verse 17. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do the honor. So now that he understands that he's not the Lord, because he said, Hey, you can't offer it unto me. you got to offer it unto the Lord, because he knew he thought he was the Lord. He's like, okay, well, what is your name then, right? If you're not the Lord, who are you? Because the Lord is a name. It's Jehovah. That's what's going on there. Look at verse 19. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered... We read verse 18 before. We skipped it just now. And offered upon a rock unto the Lord, and the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar, and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. Verse 21. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, watch this, We shall die because we have seen God. Notice that statement. Now does Manoah, Manoah's the one that says it. But does Manoah know that that was not the Lord now? He's well aware that that's not God. But do you know what he still says? We have seen God. Or we have seen you know, the Lord, if you will. It says we have seen God. So he makes that statement even though he is well aware that this is not God or this is not the Lord. Now you can interpret that however you would like in saying, go back to Genesis chapter 32, in saying that maybe that he saw maybe a glimpse of God's glory and that's what made him say this because this is angelic beings that dwell with God and are with God and maybe they believe this is a man speaking first of all. So you've got to keep that in mind. He's the one that says this. So he's saying we've seen God. So he could be saying that because he saw great glory. Because it says the angel did wondrously. Right? So he saw something that was magnificent, that was great. He saw, you know, great heavenly glory. So maybe that's why he said he made this statement. That we have seen God. Now, but let me ask you this question once more. Did Manoah understand that that was not the Lord? He did. That's clear. Was the angel the, uh, angel the Lord? And he's called the angel of the Lord. Was that angel the Lord? It was not. The angel clearly says, hey, if you want to offer an offering, you got to offer it unto the Lord. And it tells you why he said it, for the man, didn't, the man didn't know that he was an angel of the Lord. Saying he's not the Lord, he's an angel or messenger of the Lord. So Manoah at that time, obviously in his mind, thought that he was the Lord. But he was not. That's why he clarifies. That's clear. Now the consistency between Genesis 32 in the response of the person... And Judges 13 is extremely strong. I think that it would be ridiculous to just say, that's not the same person. You would have to have an agenda to say that. Now, maybe you could say, I don't know if that's the same person, but that would be ridiculous to just cast that out. When you see an angel appearing, and then you see the statement being made, and we needed, I, actually, we didn't focus on it here, but we saw the statement made, hey, we saw, you know, the, 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 the how was it worded again? The face of the Lord, seen the Lord or something along that, seen the Lord. Or is it, did it say face there? I don't think it says face in Judges 13. I think it says we've seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord is what it says. Yeah, I was, that's what I was doing in my mind. It was the same thing you were doing. I was, kept thinking about this. So he talks about he had seen God. It doesn't say Lord. It says we have seen God. That's how it's worded. We have seen God. So they make the statement we have seen God. But they're well aware that they hadn't seen God because he just told him I'm not God. Right? They saw an angel and they saw him work wondrous, you know, works, heavenly works. Then we get here, I want you to look at verse 30. It says this, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Now, does that sound familiar? Look at all of the parallels here. This is too strong to be a coincidence. Right? The man makes the exact same statement. Now, if you accept 
that the person in Judges 13, which I believe that it is, is the same person here, we know from Judges 13 that that is not the Lord. That is, that is a fact. He says that he is not the Lord. He's telling him, don't offer an offering unto me, offer unto God. That's the point, saying he's not God. Right? We see two similarities. Number one, both people that see this say, I have seen God. I have seen God face to face. So they feel the same way when they see this being. Well, who do we know that they saw in Judges 13? Use clear scripture to interpret other scriptures. We know that they, they saw an angel, an actual angel, the angel of the Lord. And that angel says he's not God. He's not the Lord. Not only that, he makes the, this identical statement, a very cryptic, specific statement that is only found in two places. And both times, it's called an angel. Look at what it says right there. In verse 30, one more time. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So notice he says, I've seen God face to face. You say, well, he must have seen Jesus. Did Manoah? Nope. What did Manoah say? I've seen God.